In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is risen. True, he is risen. I'd like to start our session tonight reading something beautiful. Before we talk about bad things, I'm going to read something good. There is no nearness or kinship equal to that of the soul with God, and God with souls. He placed in the soul understanding, will, a sovereign mind, and he enthroned in the soul yet another great refinement, and made it easily moved, light-winged, indefatigable, granting it to come and go in a single instant and in thought to serve him when the spirit wishes. In a word, he created the soul so that it might become a bride and companion of him, as has been said, he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 6.17 This is from the teaching of St. Macarius the Great, an essay by Ivan Konsevich, which appeared in Orthodox Word in 1974. This became this is part of the what became the book uh, the acquisition of the spirit in in ancient Russia by Ivan Konsevich. But I thought I'd start with something beautiful to remind us of why we're doing all this. Right? If we don't have a purely negative purpose, we have a positive purpose. I wanted to start with this beautiful patristic wisdom about the soul to remind us that of why we're talking about so many terrible and dreary things. It's not because Orthodox Christians want to be curious about bad things. Well, maybe we want to, but we shouldn't be, right? The Holy Fathers teach us not to indulge such curiosity. But it's because these bad things are already influencing us. We don't have to go looking for them. They're already there. Right? They are already on our doorstep, in our homes, in our souls. You can't escape it. Right, it's, it's there. So we have to understand it, right? We have to analyze it and understand it. It's not curiosity. Well, it can be curiosity, and I'm going to talk about that later. At the end of the at the end of the talk tonight, I'm going to talk about um, the danger of learning too much or getting too much into it, where you get fascinated by it and you can't get out of it. Um, but no, we're not doing this because of curiosity. We're doing it because we have to understand a danger. If there's a burglar in your house, you're not curious about him. You just want to. <laughs> you just, or if you're curious, it's a healthy curiosity. You want to get rid of him or get away from him, right? It is the soul that we are concerned about, the salvation of the soul, the union of the soul with God. And, of course, in orthodoxy, we have all this magnificent wisdom as well as the grace to unite the soul to God. That's our purpose. When we read beautiful passages like the one above, the one we've just read, we are recalled to ourselves, like the prodigal son, right, who came to himself. We are recalled to ourselves. We remember for what we were made and how pure and beautiful we can become. That's what Sundays are for. Today is Sunday, and Sunday is a day we should put aside all earthly cares, right? We remember our heavenly home, our heavenly goal, and how pure and beautiful the soul can be. Right? Yet we also know that we allow, we do know that we do allow so many dirty influences into our lives, so much worldliness, so much falsehood, impurity, degradation. The purpose of our survival course is not to wallow in the bad things, to talk about them endlessly, which is what a lot of well-meaning people do nowadays because people are so worried about all the bad things, right? So they talk about it maybe to the extent where beyond where they can even understand it. They just, they just get fascinated by it like the um, little bird fascinated by the snake, a little frog fascinated by the snake or the deer in the headlights, and you can't tear yourself away from the bad, right? But the purpose of our course is to help us to recognize and, uh, and abjure, to, to reject the false, the evil, the ugly, and turn to the true, the good, and the beautiful. As it says in Psalm 33, we must turn from evil and do good. If we must study evil, and sadly we must study evil, it is not an end in itself, but a preliminary step to doing good, to contemplating the good, to loving the good, to doing the good. To do good to others, we must cleanse our own souls first from the delusions planted in them by the world, the flesh, and the devil. So that's why we're working so hard to construct this orthodox lens to understand the bad things around us, right? <clears throat> Our current topic is the world of Hollywood, cinema, the movies. Last time we pointed out how even in the good old days of so-called wholesome movies, the cinema was a mighty tool for brainwashing the masses into becoming not simply post-Christian people, but even post-human humans through the destruction of the family, of traditional community, life, traditional morality, and so forth. Remember, I, uh, in that our first session on Hollywood, I talked about a movie which starred Judy Garland, who 
for the many Americans is the personified wholesome American womanhood. See, but this movie called The Clock was shot in uh, 1940s, right after World War II, shows a young um, innocent woman who's in New York City, and she falls in love with an American soldier, and they get they fall in love and get married in 48 hours. And uh, the movie is very cute and it's very touching, but it has a lot of really bad messages. You know, these are two people totally uprooted. They have no connection to their parents, no connection to their original town or village they came from. They don't really know each other, you see, and they act on impulse, mm -hmm. you see. And um, what happened in, is that World War II was a giant um, sociologi sociological experiment in America, as it was throughout the world. But in America, what it did, it, what World War II did is that it, uh, it uprooted people from their original communities, got a lot of people moving to the cities, and mixed people up. They left their religion, they left their ethnic group, they left their families, and started mixing indiscriminately. And um, and and they were uprooted and out of touch with tradition and their communities. And so and then they moved right into the 1950s and where they were being trained by television and by uh, uh, the changes in the public schools and and all kinds of and changes in child rearing, all kind of bad things that were sports. propagated. Uh, yeah, the cult of sports exploded in the 50s. Uh, the 50s is when the professional sporting associations, especially professional football, really. Um, started dominating through television and radio started dominating the public public consciousness um, so that was an example of Judy Garland very wholesome girl or at least her appearance her, her real life was very sad not wholesome but the appearance the persona right on, on the screen um, <clears throat> so even in the good old days of the silver screen and, and beautiful heroines and good heroes and so forth, there's still a lot of, there are already a lot of bad messages, right? So Hollywood is a giant delusion machine. Okay? Once you start living in the world that Hollywood portrays, you start adapting your your attitudes and your reactions to Hollywood's version of the world, right? You're no longer in reality. Okay? You're living in a hall of mirrors. And so much of our, I, 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 when I say our, I don't mean us sit, sitting here tonight in this class, but necessarily, but in general, um, Americans and Europeans also in general, and just people in, in the world, in the, in the world in general, who are everybody, everybody is just eats up American media, right? It's just everywhere, either uh, directly American media or American style media in China, in Russia, in Korea, in Africa, wherever, in Europe, of course, wherever it may be. So um, once you start living in this world it portrays, you're no longer in reality. But if you're serious about your spiritual life, as we Orthodox must be, right? To be a real Orthodox, you have to be serious about spiritual life. If you realize that to be saved, you have to cleanse your soul of illusion, of delusions, then you come to the conclusion that movie watching and TV watching must be done very carefully, if at all. Actually, if we just got rid of it altogether, it wouldn't hurt us one bit, right? All the, 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 the supposed benefits from good materials, uh, good material in the video world, um, do not outweigh the benefit that would occur accrue if we abjured it all together and just read books, said prayers, sang songs, took walks, you know, uh, and children. so forth and so forth and so on. Our lives would be much richer if we never watch any video at all. <laughs> we use that time to read, to sing, tell stories, take walks, spend time with our children, um, learn a new language, learn a new skill grow vegetables, whatever, you know, real things, and do a lot of things other people that a lot of other things that people used to do. And there's when they had spare time, they did these other things, right? They'd sit in their front porch and talk to their neighbors. Or just sit in your sit on the swing in the front porch and and you know, listen to the bird song in the evening and watch the sun go down. You know, it's more profitable than watching a movie, right? Whatever enrichment comes from the screen is so little and it's outweighed so much by the other more traditional activities that in the balance, we would gain a great deal by abjuring cinema and television altogether, right? except, except perhaps for serious instructional videos or good musical performances. There are, there are good things available now through the Internet that were not available to people everywhere. Uh, for example, learning, I'm, for example, I'm terrible at, at home improvement and um, fixing things, and my wife just says, "Go watch a video," and I'll, I'll actually, and I have to admit that it, when I watch somebody do it, it's just an ordinary, not an actor, but just an ordinary person who makes a little video for his neighbor, 
for his neighbors, you know, so they know how to fix their lawnmower or something. Then, you know, you, we can't say those are all bad things. Or that's all useless, right? But, but on the whole, uh, we'd be better off severely limiting it, or very, very careful about what we, what we watch or what we listen to uh, on the internet and through movies and television. Okay. So most of us are not going to abjure the screen altogether, <clears throat> but I want to at least give an orthodox interpretation of what's out there. And tonight I'm not really talking so much about internet or YouTube videos as the movies. Okay. And a lot of people still go watch movies. You can see the statistics in the newspaper after every weekend, how many billions were spent on people watching movies. Right. In order to help us at least be on our guard and be selective of what we watch, and be highly critical of what we watch. Okay. In this session, I'd like to cover five topics about the movies. Subliminal messages, predictive programming, and I'll explain these terms if we don't understand what they are. Uh, some of us don't understand what the, I mean by these terms. I'll explain them. Subliminal messages, predictive programming, the normalization of the obscene, the brainwashing of children, the destruction of rational thought and attention span, and initiation into the occult. Well, that's, that's a lot to cover in one one session, but I'm just going to touch lightly in each of these because we could do a whole you could do a whole semester on each of these <laughs> subjects. They should okay. be done. They are very important. Yeah, these are all, all of these things are are powerful within the movies. Basic. They're powerful within the movies. One subliminal messages are real. I remember. Let's let's return to to this thought we began with tonight. Nothing is more precious than the soul. Nothing is more urgent than guarding the soul. Yet movies not only deliver false messages and evil and ugly images to our conscious minds, movies also contain subliminal messages. We don't know how many. We don't know how many are being put into even a totally... So you could take a, a movie that doesn't have any bad content, a very wholesome movie, but they could be putting subliminal messages at an unconscious level. That they, it, The technology is very simple to do. That. Even the old technology with celluloid, they could do this with proje with projected celluloid back in the 1950s. Okay. So I had heard about, when I was a young man, I'd heard about subliminal advertising back in the 70s and 80s. We were told that it was something tried back in the 1950s, but then outlawed, that Congress passed legislation outlawing it. See, um, And that it didn't happen anymore. We were told that this doesn't happen anymore. This is a, a bad thing. That the move the um, Never happened. that they were doing back in the fifties, but it dis it's it got outlawed. It's been policed. It's not happening anymore. And one evening, I was in a theater in it was the it was the um, summer of nineteen eighty three. I remember this. I was visiting a friend in Baltimore, and I was watching a movie in a theater. And at one point, the projector malfunctioned and it slowed down. Oh. Okay, and then suddenly, instead of the movie, one saw a young woman immodestly dressed smiling very seductively while holding a bag of popcorn and a soft drink. So they were using the sex appeal, right, so-called, to sell popcorn and soft drinks. Of course, this technology can be used to sell much, much more destructive things. It was described, exactly, that was described somewhere. Sure, oh yeah, there's, there's a lot of there's documentation pop of this. And a lot of documentation about this. So, so this is Pavlovian conditioning at its best, right? It's, and you don't even know it's being done to you. This is real. So you're in a theater, you really don't know how much of this is going on, and, and, and you don't know how much of it's far worse than popcorn, just selling you popcorn and soft drinks, right? So you really have no idea what kind of commercial or political or social engineering images or messages are being slipped into the movies, even nice movies, right, that you're watching. Messages that are completely under the radar screen of your consciousness. This alone should make one highly cautious about movie watching, right? So this is, this is a real thing. This goes on, okay? Another aspect of the movies, I of a lot of uh, current movies I want to talk about is called predictive programming. Um, and there are a couple of terms I want to introduce that are very useful terms. These terms were coined by uh, an author that I read sometimes, a man named Michael Hoffman, who lives in Idaho. He's a journalist, and um, he's a, what's called a revisionist historian, which simply means that he tries to tell – he tries to, to uncover the real truth about things that have happened instead of the official or establishment version of what's happened. And his uh, website's called revisionisthistory.org. One word, revisionisthistory.org. I, I, again, when I introduce these authors in our series, I'm not endorsing everything they say or believe. 
Hey, he's a non-Orthodox. He's a traditionalist Roman Catholic of kind of a renegade variety. I think he goes to a traditional Latin Latin Mass chapel for his Mass. But he even even that he's not he's not totally on board with the traditional Catholic line either because he's written a huge book exposing Renaissance papacy as being an occult organization. So Michael Michael is a very special person. I'd like to meet him one day in person. Um, but he has a, he has a lot of wisdom, and one he's coined two terms that are very useful. One term is the cryptocracy. Of course, kryptos in Greek means hidden, and the kratia means the authorities, the hidden authority. So the cryptocracy is his very nice term. I, I shouldn't not nice, but very um, useful term for the hidden powers behind the throne, the people that actually control the levers of power in the government, media, education, and so forth. So, so there's this cryptocracy. And they and the cryptocracy sometimes uses predictive programming, and I'm going to explain what that means. Uh, we know that this occult global elite, the cryptocracy, as Michael Hoffman calls it, is creating this new humanity that will embrace the disordered social order of the Antichrist. Okay, so they're creating disordered people who will embrace a disordered society, the society that of the spirit. Or the actual, and at the end, the actual society of, of the actual Antichrist. So this institutionalized disorder, and that's what's being created is institutionalized disorder. So it has the facade of the institution and order, but on the in the, in, the inside is all disorder, right? So this institutionalized disorder is coming into being all around us. We see it every day in our in our my life as a priest, your life, you know, your professional lives, business lives. We see it all around us. Right? At each stage of the process. Of, of making this disorder worse, right? Each, they keep ratcheting it up. They keep moving to a new level. At each stage of the process, the cryptocracy acts secretly at first. At first, they do it under the radar screen. And they tell you, no, that's not happening. That's not happening. Oh, you're crazy. That's not going on, right? They tell you you're crazy if you think it's going on. They keep it secret. But then, when they have, when they believe that the masses are ready to accept the message, they reveal what they've been up to. They reveal what's been done to us. Now, some people call this predictive programming. Michael Hoffman calls it the revelation of the method. We've done it to you. Now we're going to reveal it to you. But you know why they do that? The reason they do it is because if they, if they trick you, mm -hmm. in God's eyes, you are not that mm -hmm. killed. Right. If they tell you, you know, they tell you now you're it. right. They tell you now mm -hmm. you're responsible. That's right. So God's going to judge you if you don't react, right? Right. You're right. But that's also that's an opportunity, though, for repentance. You see, so remember that all these people, these cryptocracy, these elites, uh, conspiracies, whoever they are, and the demons themselves are under God's sovereign power. Right? They're not God. They're not all-powerful. So God's working even through them to bring about our salvation. Right? That's a good point, you know, that, that this revelation, in a, in a way, God almost forces them, the demons, to reveal. It's like the demons confess who Jesus was. So they do yeah, it's everywhere. This information's all out there. Okay, so they reveal the message. Okay, the, what they've done to us. This gives them a malicious feeling of satisfaction. They, ha ha! Remember that these people are demonized, and they so they have the sadistic minds of demons. Also, they're hooligan minds, right? They're actually crude. They're clever. The demons and people who work for the demons are very clever, but at the same time. In a way, they're kind of stupid. They have very low minds, and they take satisfaction in very low-level things, like making, like saying, "Aha! Look, we've got you." You know. So, but this revelation of the method, this serves a practical function in the revolution. It creates predictive programming, so it programs the minds of the masses to accept that this or that social change may be something unpleasant or even evil. Most people don't like it at first. I mean, nobody liked the gay movement at first, right? Nobody likes transgenderism and so forth. Or nobody way back when nobody liked divorce. Nobody liked legalized divorce, or very few people, right? Way back when. Divorce, no, forget it, right? Nobody liked it at first. But it programs the minds of the masses to accept that this or that change, although it's unpleasant or evil, but it's inevitable. So that's when people give up. See, they don't repent. They're presented with this opportunity, but most people feel overwhelmed. They think this is inevitable. It was an example of how you can make people accept cannibalism. And they explain, I have it somewhere. 
Okay, Even cannibalism, yeah. First they bring it up, everybody's against yeah, it. Yeah, they talk but about it, talk about it, talk about it. The scientists, they may, maybe. <laughs> they talk about it. Yeah, they, 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 yeah, exactly. By, by forcing people to talk about it constantly, after a while, people's defenses go down. That's why we don't really want to talk about evil things all the time. You're tired. Right? Um, so it programs, when they reveal the, what they've done, it programs the minds of the masses to accept that this or that social change the one pleasant or evil, but it's inevitable. You can't resist. You know, resistance is futile. And therefore, the one may cheer the cinema hero who fights the evil. They put a good guy in the movie to fight the evil, right? But you see the evil as a normal part of life. He's fighting it, but it's normal. It's, it's part of life. It's not something utterly bizarre, unthinkable, or outlandish, something you'd never even think about. Now they're making you think about it as if it's something that's part of life. Okay? So one accepts it, that it's part of the yin yang of an amoral universe. You know, this whole idea that good and evil are equal, and that they're eternally in balance with each other, this yin yang idea, which is a profoundly demonic idea. Uh, it's part of Oriental religions. You see it everywhere. Yeah, the yin yang symbol and all that kind of thing. And the, the coexist idea, all that is to accept evil, right? That it, that it exists, and yeah, the good guy's fighting, you're cheering the heroes fighting it, but you know that it's going to go on and on, there's no end to it. And you've got to accept that evil is part of life, right? A, norm, a normal part of life, it's a normalization of the evil. So one example of this predictive programming, uh, and I'm just going to give one example. I can, tonight, I could, you know, we could give a whole course on this, countless examples. But one example is a series of movies based on a character called Jason Bourne, a CIA assassin whose memory and identity have been destroyed by brainwashing and who has been programmed to kill people upon being activated by certain triggers. So he's a person who seems like a regular guy, he's got a job, he's going along, and suddenly he's triggered by something and he goes out and assassinates somebody. The frightening reality is that the CIA had, and well, probably still has, just such a program. Back in the 50s and 60s, it was called MK Ultra. I don't know what they call it now. They've had to, obviously they've had to hide it They've had to morph it into something else and hide it to, to go on doing it. Um, so the CIA had just such a program which did precisely this. And this is highly documented. There was a congressional investigation into this, I think it was the 1970s. Or there's, there are mountains of evidence. Now, after the Freedom of Information Act, you could acquire all this evidence that this actually went on. And it's probably now it's probably now going on, right? The massive moviegoers watching these movies don't really care about the horrendous social implications of such a revelation. They're just cheering on the heroes, Jason Bourne and his allies, as I try to recover their real identities. And it's actually, in a way, it's very moving. I've seen, I can't stand to watch an entire movie of this. I'll watch a few minutes of it. And it's actually kind of moving when you see ordinary people, lives being destroyed, and they're trying to recover their identity, and they're trying to fight this huge organization that's trying to destroy them. Okay, and they're they're trying to atone for their past crimes because they've assassinated people, right? And they want to atone it by exposing the big the big bad guy who is the CIA. In the movie, it's clear that it is the CIA who's doing it, right? An agency of the American government. What the moviegoers don't realize is that they are being programmed too. They're, they're now, they're part of the experiment. You don't think these movies weren't approved by the CIA, right? You don't think that the Hollywood, Hollywood people involved in making these movies didn't have connections to say, of course they do, right? So they're being programmed not to accept the CIA as the good guys, you know, yeah, we could boo them, they're the bad guys, boo, boo, the CIA. But that this kind of thing, though it may be distasteful to us, is normal, that's part of life. Which one is, it's even more powerful? Manchurian candidate. Well, the Manchurian candidate is the original, classic. Original. Yeah, the original Manchurian candidate with with Frank Sinatra. Another one. Yeah, they made, they made a, a, a like a, a office life. Yeah, a less uh, no office life. No, something. Totally but um, no, the this Manchurian candidate is a movie that's that's a movie made in the early '60s. It's free. That is an it's, free. it's yeah it's on the internet and um it's a very well made movie. Believe it or not, Frank Sinatra actually was a good actor as well as uh, as well as a, a singer. And um, it's a it's a it's a classic. It's a, a very well made movie, and it's about some, uh, it's a bro about a programmed assassin. Someone's programmed to assassinate a candidate for the president of the United States, presidency of the United States. And uh, it came out. But what's eerie is that it came out right before the Kennedy assassination. 
So this is the people who theorize about this say, well, look, they're, they're always producing these revelations of these things right before or after they do something, you see. And, uh, of course, you can go you, – you could spend – unfortunately, what could sp- and unfortunately, many good people spend too many hours trying to figure out all of this. You can't figure out all of it. There's no bottom to it, right? Like can you, you could – there are people who devoted their life to the Kennedy assassination. Well, we don't need to devote our lives to that. We just know bad people – really bad people did it, and uh, it was very evil, and um, – and it was part of this whole cryptocracy plan. In the movie, plan. it's very well explained how they were going to kill Kennedy next year. Yeah. Next year. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was, it was, it was pretty... It's, it's pretty what, what's sad is that Frank Sinatra, who's one of the... the uh, plays the hero in the movie, um, was Kennedy's close friend. Hmm. That's an interesting aspect of that. Now, here's another movie, The Matrix. The Matrix is probably the most paradigmatic example of predictive programming. The ones become what's called a cultural icon. Everybody knows about the Matrix. People, uh, just as people will instinctively refer to the Godfather movies, they'll also instinctively refer to images, terminology from the Matrix. It depicts a future world in which superintelligent machines have reduced all of humanity to inert, completely passive beings hooked up to serve the machines as an energy source. Now, that's a dumb idea. Of course, <laughs> human bodies can't serve as a batteries to run, to run computers. Um, but that's the concept of the movie. So, so the whole human race is passive. They're they're just hooked up. They're just like this, hooked up to the machines. But they're kept. They don't rebel because the machines entertain them by projecting an illusory world into their brains. Right. So a few people escape the matrix. They try to fight back, and this is the basis of the plot. Okay. Again, even if the audience cheers the people fighting the matrix as they cheer Jason Bourne fighting CIA. The world depicted in the movie is normalized. This is the way things are. This is what we've done to you. Get over it. See, It is, of course, an image of what has already been done to everyone. The reduction of vast masses of potentially creative and intelligent, not to mention religious, people to being couch potatoes or screen junkies, living in an illusory world, which is what we're talking about tonight. Right? Living that illusory world. So both the Bourne movies and The Matrix and the other movies like it, they do identify the cryptocracy, the evil power structure, as evil. They say, yes, this is evil. The CIA or the, the evil machines or whoever it may be. They're, yeah, they're evil. Okay, or the Manchurian candidate, you know, the, the plot behind the Manchurian candidate. Yeah, they're evil. But in, other, but in a way they're saying, get over it. You know, this is the way life is. And so these movies... And all these movies do so in the context of a dualistic, ultimately meaningless and endless universe. Okay, but dualism is the idea that good and evil are, are both eternal and equal, and there's never any end to the conflict. Right. So the hero is ultimately, the heroic figure is ultimately doomed to failure. He can never really overcome evil. Right. So this is the world you live in. Get over it. Um, there's no ultimate hope. There's no ultimate escape. Of course, the hero in the Matrix does escape in a sense. He gets power and fights the bad guys, but he does so in a very occult way. He does it. All the all the positive religious message in the Matrix is all uh, uh, goofy, um, pseudo mystical Oriental hogwash, right? Um, and that's the level about that's that's the level of religion that's presented right in, in this movie. But it's so predictive. Then to summarize, and predictive programming is involves programming people to accept what's being done or has been done to them by presenting it in the movies as or in the various media as normal or as the status quo. And it's like the feeling is give up. That this is the way things are. But as you pointed out, when for a, a conscious Orthodox Christian, that should be, or for any conscious human being of integrity, that should be a chance for rejection. I see it. I uh, now I. I understand, ah, this is being done to us. It's not just a conspiracy theory. It's really happening. I reject it. I'll fight it. I'm against it. I'll recognize it and reject it. But unfortunately, the effect on most people is his despair or just the feeling of inevitability or acceptance. And meanwhile, they're being entertained. See, it's also entertaining. They're also very well made. They're very, very entertaining. So you're just content to, 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 watch the, to watch this play out, but not reject the entire... Um, schema behind the thing. Okay. 
Another topic I want to talk about is the normalization of the obscene. Let's go back and review this term obscene. In earlier classes, we have talked about the concept of the obscene. The term nowadays, in the term connotes just something dirty, but actually that's not the precise meaning of the word. The term does not necessarily mean something dirty or even something negative. It doesn't even mean something that's in itself that's bad. It means something so sacred or so profane at either end of the spectrum that's so sacred or so bad or so dirty that it should not be seen or spoken of in public. I've seen behind this. Ob shena. Ob, away from in Latin. Ob, away from and shena, the, the, the stage. stage. Off the stage of public life. It should not don't be. Don't talk about it. Don't talk about it. Don't show it. Um, whether the stage of the theater or the stage of life. The, the term uh, arose in specifically in the context of theater because in the ancient classical theater, there were strict rules that certain things should not be depicted. One of them was extreme suffering. But even when suffering is depicted as in some of the, the, the Greek tragedies, it's done in a very stylized or formal way, not in a gory or detailed or graphic way. Even in Shakespeare, which is much more um, graphic and more realistic than classical theater, all the suffering is very, is highly refined. The, the worst suffering in Shakespeare, I think, are the, the scenes of madness in King Lear. And even in, the, even in those scenes, he's so noble, he's so wonderful, that you, that you, uh, you can't help but be um, edified or uplifted by this, you see. Um, but this has been totally <laughs> forgotten, all right? So the entire media machine... The entire great stereopticon we've been describing, starting with the newspapers, has done catastrophic damage to formerly Christian people's understanding of the obscene. The newspapers. Uh, you know, it, it, it should be considered obscene or not for public view to expose the suffering of a family that's lost a family member in an accident or in a crime. But what do the journalists do? They rush to the home of parents whose child has been murdered so what do you, what, how do you feel about this? What do you think about this? You see, and the public wallows in the emotions of these suffering people. This is really evil. It's it's really extremely evil. And it harms the it it harms people. the family, and then it harms the public that are that are um, being titillated by the sufferings of these other people. And the the journalists and the public who watch this will say, "Well, we feel sorry for them. We're empathizing with them." No, it just it's coarseness. It creates. A lack of sympathy, ultimately, because it becomes normalized. You see, so um, so I'm not speaking of explicitly only. I'm not speaking only of explicitly sexual subject matter, though that's included, of course. That's just you know everywhere now. But another subject considered by the ancients to be obscene is any kind of extreme human suffering. The depiction of which was banned altogether or handled very delicately in Greek drama and also even in modern drama, like in Shakespeare. But now we have thousands of movies, usually around two hours long. Most movies are feature movies are from an hour and a half to three hours long, usually around two hours long, that depict human suffering, both physical and worse, psychological or spiritual suffering, right? In excruciating detail, with amazing technological uh, competency and and professional acting, and, and all the the vast apparatus of cinema, right? depicting human suffering in excruciating, painful detail for two hours. Okay. Thousands and thousands of viewing hours every weekend in America, right, or throughout the world, rather. But this, and this is horrible <laughs> because it does not create compassion in the viewers. It creates the opposite. It coarsens the viewer. Right? Someone else's suffering, whether real or fictional, should never be a source of entertainment. I'll say that again. Someone else's suffering whether real or imaginary, should never be a source of entertainment. You, you should not sit there eating popcorn and drinking Coke and watching someone suffer. Or curiosity. Uh, it's, it's also, it, it titillates uh, uh, a, a vulgar curiosity, or evil curiosity. Okay. Another obscene subject, a subject that should be off stage, was the dead human body. Traditionally, the body is handled with great decorum and reverence. 
and it is shown in public only with carefully within carefully re regulated traditional rituals, right, within a, a sacred ritual, then the body of the dead is then displayed to mourners, the people who come to pay respects to the dead. Okay? But now we have thousands of hours of movies and TV shows in which dead bodies are shown in every conceivable state of degradation, mutilation, destruction, right? and examined callously by police investigators, forensic investigators, and so forth. The whole series, the CI something, CIS or something like that, there are these, there's a whole television series based on uh, for forensic investigation of murder victims, and it shows dead bodies for a great, it shows them examining dead bodies over and over again. Okay? This is terrible. The importance of this cannot be overemphasized. I know to a lot of people who watch TV or movies, I, maybe I sound crazy, but I'm telling you, this is really evil. The importance of this cannot be overemphasized. It is the breaking down of a very sacred, very ancient barrier. And the children. And children who see this. Yeah, parents who sit there with their children and watch this. I mean, this is just unthinkable. Okay? It's a transgression of an ancient barrier that's profoundly evil. A transgression that, the transgression that is, is profoundly evil. That make, it makes something snap inside of people. Something breaks inside of them. Okay? Something that was holy inside of them. Not just Orthodox baptized people, but just human beings, from just being human beings. Right? It snaps inside of them. Something really ancient and sacred snaps, <laughs> breaks inside of them. Right? And it leads them to a lower level of humanity. It coarsens them. It has, makes them have less compassion for human nature and for, the, for other people. And this, the sacredness of the human body. And they act accordingly. And then, then they act out, right. Then they act out. Right. And this is, this is no joke. Okay. And obviously, the, obviously, also, another obscene thing, of course, is the, this vortex of filthy language, filthy sexual behavior. We all know about that. In the so-called average movie, this, this filthy language and filthy behavior, long ago, long ago, transgress the traditional boundaries of the obscene. Actually, back in the 1930s, they were trying to make um, movies that were very sexually suggestive. If you look at, I'm not suggesting spending a lot of time looking at these things, but if, if you don't believe me, go back and just look for, at 20 minutes of a, a movies made in the early 1930s with a romantic subject matter, and they're very risque. They're quite, they're quite risque, quite racy. And the people who intervened and stopped this were the Roman Catholic bishops in America, who at that time were very conservative. And they had, at one time, you know, when I was a child in the early 1960s, the United States had a population of 180 million. 60 million were Roman Catholics. And 90% of them went to church every Sunday. So they, at that time, they formed a, a barrier to moral degradation. And the Catholic bishops in the 1930s really pushed very hard to have a code imposed on movies. The, the, and um, this code was imposed, and movies started being uh, less sexually suggestive. And this lasted until the 1950s. It lasted for about 20 years. And uh, that's why there, there seemed to be more wholesome movies in the late 1930s. Of course, the 40s had a lot of propaganda movies, but there were also the wholesome like family movies and that kind of thing. And also westerns, which mostly are quite wholesome. Um, the famous American westerns, um, but but um, but the the all the all hell broke loose in the late fifties and the, certainly in the sixties. And movies have just plummeted since then in their level of um, sexually offensive material. All this transgression of the boundaries of the obscene have so coarsened the average person that converting non-Orthodox people or converting Orthodox people to repentance in the conscious spiritual life has become incalculably more difficult. The task of a priest today or any catechist or a parent is so much more difficult now, right? For the most, the most fundamental, you know, people, people just immersed in the media culture their most fundamental healthy human reactions to essential human experiences. Suffering, death, language, sexual behavior have been destroyed. Okay, all the, not only the revealed teachings of the church, 
or the, the philosophic teachings of the philosophers, but even instinctive human reactions to certain things have been destroyed okay, or greatly um, disabled. Replaced. And replaced, yes, with other reactions, yes. Another topic I want to touch on, and again, this could be a whole semester course, is the brainwashing of children. All right. We are experts on. Yeah, in 1989, and again, I'm going to use a, a specific um, example to, to illustrate my point. In 1989, after a hiatus of many years in which they had produced no feature-length animated movies, <clears throat> Disney Studios premiered their reinterpretation of Hans Christian Andersen's The Little Mermaid. It's hard to believe now that it's, uh, this is uh, 30 years ago. Okay. In Andersen's original telling of the story, the Little Mermaid is punished for her unnatural desire to become a human being. She's a mermaid. She falls in love with a prince who's a human being. She wants to become a human being. But in the process, she loses herself. and She does not get what she wants. She's punished for this unnatural, for something unnatural against the will of God, right? against the, against the, the natural order. <clears throat> she does not win the man she loves. She becomes something neither mermaid nor woman, but a bodiless spirit floating in the wind, which is a fitting metaphor for someone who has rejected his God-given nature. She has to, at the end of the story, she has to do like a purgatory of 300 years before she can be released for her crime against the, the natural order. Right? In the Disney version, however, the Little Mermaid rejects her father's authority. She rejects her nature as a mermaid. She makes a deal with a witch, or it's a deal with a devil, to change her into a human being. And after a bit of scary trouble, she does get in trouble. There's a little danger there. But she gets away with it, right? Her boyfriend, the prince, fights the witch and kills the witch, and somehow that releases her with no repentance. Right? So the message is clear. Disobey your father. Deny your God-given nature. Obey your passions. And thrive. You'll come out on top. You'll be the winner. And uh, since that time, Disney has produced one movie after another fe featuring headstrong girls. It's a feminist message, right? Headstrong girls who transgress traditional boundaries and come out on top. But these are not ugly, um, masculine, 1960s, 70s feminists. These are beautiful girls, and it's highly sexualized. These girls are always in their early teens... They're they're just ba they're really only briefly into their teens. They're, they're like early teens. The Little Mermaid figure looks like a girl who who could have been fourteen or fifteen, but already has a voluptuous figure and is wearing immodest clothing. And this is this is uh, pervade as children's entertainment. I've seen them at church today. Yeah, it's a sexualizing of young girls, right? Besides the feminist message. Okay, so the occult and feminist message. The message of witchcraft, the goddess, who is stronger than the traditional patriarchal authority by means of her magical power. This message could not be clearer. That's the message of the movie. Okay. Normally, of course, in the cute Disney style, and it's still cute, right? They make everything cute. The heroine does not hate or destroy her father. That would be too uh, upfront, right? The father is usually a lovable bumbler. He's impotent, not evil. He's just impotent. He's stupid, right? Or, or just, or if he's not stupid, he's somehow captive or, or impotent. She may, in fact, rescue her father or, or even be reconciled to him. But it, it is clear who is in charge, the strong little girl who has magical powers. You see? And this series of beloved movies, okay, stretching back 30 years now, seen by millions and millions of children, and by their parents, of course, partners in crime with the studio, is only one example of the ceaseless barrage of brainwashing aimed at children seven days a week, 24 hours a day, through the movies, through televisions, and so forth. So if people want their children to be saved, if you want to save your children's souls, you have to understand the real message of what the children are watching. You have to take action. You have to do something. Turn it off. Just turn, turn it yeah, just, just turn it off. Take a walk. Turn it into the garbage. Go, yeah, get rid of it. Right? Don't, don't do it. Don't watch it. It's so simple. Yes. And um, a whole... 
there's a vast amount of um, documentation, and uh, there are all sorts of YouTube videos on the evil just in the Disney, and not just the new Disney controlled by the cosmopolitan element, but even the old Disney controlled by the by the we eccentric Gentile um, Walt Disney. I'm not sure about. It. Well, you know, Walt Disney's a strange character. He had himself cryogenically frozen when he died because he, he, he claimed to believe that some, one day science would be able to resurrect the dead. So he had himself frozen. He's not... So um, so you could, you could do a whole study just on the, the whole Disney phenomenon, um, which is extremely evil. Disneyland and Dis- – no Orthodox Christian sure. should go to Disney World Disneyland. I'm appalled. I'm shocked, absolutely shocked near Orthodox Christians, even priests – Taking their children to, to Disney World, absolutely shocked, because it's extremely evil, and uh, it's it's now a big di- the whole Disney um, uh, enterprise is now a big advocate of uh, sodomy. They have, you know, they they have pro gay days at Disney Disney World, where you see Mickey walking around with Mickey instead of Mickey walking with Minnie, and M- Mickey's kissing each other. Mickey Mouse kiss, kissing another Mickey Mouse, not Minnie Mouse. That's witchcraft. Yeah. Witchcraft. Oh, and not to mention the witchcraft. So there's a whole – you could do a whole study just on Disney. So anyway, so uh, speaking of movies, then the brainwashing of children. Another topic, the destruction of rational thought and attention span. Even when a two-hour movie has a serious plot and a rational dialogue, and there are such things, there are some really beautiful movies right, that are intelligent. But even even then, it disarranges your idea of the normal. After all, life's problems are not solved in two hours. Right? But increasingly now, we have movies and television shows that have no plot. They have no dialogue. They consist of very short scenes, often, depending on the genre, consisting of or at least assisted by outlandish computer-generated images and special effects, often very violent and very bizarre. Chaos. Right? Chaos, exactly, chaos. Perhaps with a few telegraphic disjointed utterances, there might be some speech, <laughs> some a few ridiculous utterances by the characters involved. The, the viewer's mind is assaulted with a rapid, endless succession of violent, disturbing imagery, and there is simply no room for rational thought, no room for the development of a real story or real ideas. Okay. On the surface, you might just say, well, this is just totally ridiculous, which it is. I mean, these, these Marvel movies, Marvel comic movies, with the superheroes and all that, it's just ridiculous. But it's ridiculous on the surface, but, what it's, but, but the vast majority of people, 95% of people, aren't, in, in, aren't clever enough or intelligent enough to realize this is ridiculous. <laughs> and they're, they're just being programmed by this stuff, right? Their, their minds are being destroyed. The universe presented in these kinds of movies is not a cosmos, which means an ordered world. Cos- cosmos, the word cosmos is from cosmeo, which means to adorn or to put into order, right? So a cosmos is an ordered world. It was presented as a chaotic and meaningless world of disconnected, rapid sense experiences, often very violent, things blowing up or people turning into monsters, you know, things really demonic and, and just insane chaotic imagery and happening one after another so quickly you can hardly even keep up with it. This is part of the campaign to destroy linear rational thinking and replace it with thinking, so-called thinking, in visual images and in feelings. So-called, it's not really thinking, of course. Thus vastly increasing people's susceptibility to being conditioned and manipulated. Right. So that's uh, all the movies. If you go see these action movies, or even even not even not even movies that are advertised as action movies, often movies that are advertised as having a serious subject, now, the scenes are very short. It's in a staccato telegraphic style. Confusion. And it's confusion, yes. You don't even know what's going on. But, but after a while, the, the, the people watching the movie don't care what's going on. They're just being entertained by the, by the visual imagery, and they're, in, they're wallowing in the feelings Emotion. and the stimulation created by the images and the sounds. And the, they're, they're, they're swimming in the chaos. They've let go, and they're just swimming in the chaos and enjoying it. And you open yourself up. Yes, they're opening. They're opening their the the doors of the spirit to demonic influence. It's it's really ABC. And if you know Orthodox spiritual psychology, this is just 
Orthodoxy 101. It's like initiation. initiation. Yes. It's like initiations where they keep you up for 24 hours and uh, they, they tell you contradictory things and they get you to say the opposite of what you know is true. They're destroying the, they're, they're breaking down rationality. Right. Another topic is a very serious topic is the initiation into the occult. We've earlier discussed theater in our, uh, in our, um, I think a segment on the radio, we start discussing theater as an initiation into the, into the Dionysian spirit. Remember, the, um, we pointed out that the origin of Greek drama is that the Greek dramas were presented each year as part of the, of the great Dionysia, the, uh, a festival dedicated to the god Dionysus, who's the god of wine, but also the god of, the god of intoxication, but also of excess, of, of, of ecstasy, including violent and sexual ecstasy. It's very important to remember that all drama has a ritual character. You know, drama disappeared, theater disappeared in the Christian era. It only reappeared when the West started drifting away from orthodoxy. You see. And uh, drama, the, the liturgy replaced drama. The liturgy being the true drama, it replaced the old Dionysian drama of the Greeks. You see. And that the reappearance of theater in the late Middle Ages and Renaissance specifically occurred in the West that was falling away <coughs> from orthodoxy. And in Orthodox countries, it's an importation from the West. 1800s. In the, yeah, 1800s. no earlier than the 1800s. That's right. That's right. Well, maybe in Russia in the 1700s because of Peter the Great. But in the Balkans, 1800s. Yeah. <clears throat> so you may think you're simply being entertained, but in fact, you're being initiated ritually into some kind of transformative mystery. Even at a very simple level. It doesn't have to, not life-changing, but in a huge sense, but life-changing in a small sense, right? Or maybe in a big sense. You're being initiated ritually into some kind of transformative mystery, a life-changing crisis and resolution. And now, to review these concepts, you can go back to our segment on theater. Uh, we, were to, we were making the bridge between uh, uh, radio and theater and uh, talking about that. This is true in general of all drama. It's the origin and rationale of drama, as we have discussed earlier. Okay. But there are some movies, perhaps a large number, whose creators have purposely constructed in order uh, to brainwash the audience with occult symbolism and occult messages. Which, I mean, drama in general is a, initiatory into some kind of Dionysian ecstasy or uh, a pseudo-transcendence. But nowadays, and probably going back some time now, decades now, we have movies that in which the occult symbolism and occult messages and occult ritual are purposely either um, subtly, in, in, subtly put into the movies, a little under the radar screen, or openly, right? Sometimes this is overt. Usually it's hidden in some way under the surface of the story. This should not surprise us since we know that the movie industry is controlled by an anti-Christian power structure that is deeply involved in the occult. Okay, so they're occultists, and they put their message into the movies. So if you watch them... You're initiated. You don't know that you're being initiated. You're initiated. Now, I'm going to make some remarks about a young man named Jay Dyer. And I, I have to make these remarks because I've been requested by young Orthodox people <clears throat> who listen to Jay and read his writings to talk about it. Uh, people, I got mess after I talked about um, movies and the last time. Young people wrote me and said, "What about Jay Dyer?" Because a lot of people are listening to to Jay, and I've listened to him too, and I've read his articles. So, a remarkably intelligent young man, an American convert to Orthodox named Jay Dyer. I think he's from the South, but I think he's moved to California now. He's written two books on this subject of the occult in movies, decoding. He calls it Hollywood decoded, where he decodes the movies. I've been asked by some of our listeners to comment on Mr. Dyer's work, since he's very popular now among with the younger conservative or younger traditionalist internet audience, including many young Orthodox people who listen to him or who read his articles. Probably, probably only old fogies like me actually read his articles. Everybody else is just probably just watching his videos. First of all, we have to separate Dyer's substance from his style. Substance is terrible. I mean, the, the, not the substance. The style is terrible, <laughs> at least for an old old fogey like me. 
I would suggest that one read some of the articles on his website first. His website is called Jay's Analysis. And by the way, a little, a little reminder. When I, when I talk about Jay Dyer, that's when I talk about Michael Hoffman. Or when I mentioned other great scholars like Christopher Dawson or Sorokin or people like that, I'm not recommending everything they say. I'm not endorsing all their views. I don't agree with Jay Dyer's views about quite a few things. Right? I'm just saying this is a resource, and you have to understand that a lot of people are reading this, Orthodox people are reading this, and he has some good things to say, but you have to be careful. Right? He's not a holy father, not a saint. Right? Um, so we have to separate his substance from his style. I would suggest that one read some of the articles on his website first. If you want to understand something, always better to read not watch a video or listen, not at first. Read and think about it. Because when you're reading, you've got it under control. Right? Especially the articles having little to do with movies or conspiracies or politics. He has a huge website with all kind of talks about movies, conspiracy theories, politics, um, so forth and so on. And many of them are quite, a lot of the information he gives is quite important. But start off reading his articles on philosophy and theology, which are for the most part quite good. He's amazing. Uh, he's a young man who's just actually read books and, and is reading them all the time. Um, in some places, I'd say some of his articles are even brilliant. In particular, and I appreciated it because I'm a former Roman Catholic, for Roman Catholics considering converting to Orthodoxy, uh, Dyer's exposition of the errors in Roman Catholic theology are very good. They're very good. Okay. I think he's even brought up some objections to Roman Catholic theology that even a lot of the Orthodox scholars haven't thought about. He's, some of it's actually original in a good sense. Okay. But his style in the videos is often silly and vulgar. And in some places he uses language totally unacceptable for an Orthodox Christian. He uses dirty words. Okay. This is not acceptable for an Orthodox. In street parlance, he is what is called a shock jock. That's radio talk in the radio industry. A shock jock is someone who, who uh, he's a media personality who attracts attention through coarseness of expression. He's coarse. He's, he, uh, again, he, obscene. He breaks the boundaries, right? And he also wastes a lot of time on just being silly. But that, along with the vulgarity, is, I suppose, what appeals to a lot of people today. <laughs> okay? It's appealing to a lot of people, including Orthodox, Orthodox people, right? I venture to say, I hope, I, I venture to say, I, I hope that he's, not really advocating being like this, but that he's developed this on-screen persona to convey that he is for real. Right? I'm, I'm for real. I'm honest. Right? He's not a fake. He's not a phony, pseudo-intellectual snob, but a down-to-earth guy with a real message for the millennials, the generation that's fed up with, their, with the quite real hypocrisy and emptiness of their baby boomer parents. Here in America, people in my generation are called the baby boomers because we were the part of a huge population explosion that occurred when the GIs came home from World War II and from Korea. So our, our, our fathers were World War II and Korea vets, and they married our mothers and had large families. And But then they, they ruined us because we were raised on television and toys and sports and Disney, and we were being coddled instead of whipped. And so we became these horrible people. That I'd say the worst generation in American history. Okay, So Jay's reacting against this, and he's got a lot of fellow young people his age who also are disgusted, young people who have become more conservative, more traditional, more religious, and they're disgusted with their parents, with their liberal parents. Right? But unfortunately, the result is that a mature person with any refinement of mind can take this boy either only in small doses, or if you persevere for the sake of the often excellent content, that's a sad thing, it's excellent content with a very stupid style. right? So you can only take it in, if you keep watching him, you can take it in small doses, or you have a lot of. You can keep watching it or listening to it with a lot of inner revulsion at the way he presents a lot of it. Not all of his talks are, are coarse or vulgar, um, and and he's very very intelligent, and I believe he's very sincere, uh, but a lot of the style is is uh, uh, repulsive. So uh, and and it isn't just old people. I, I suggested him to a young Orthodox man one time who's also a millennial, right? He once tried watching Jay and my recommendation, and he turned the video off after five minutes because <laughs> the style was so crude. Okay. So, like, now, uh, let's, so that's a little word on Jay Dyer, you know, the, good and the, the good and the bad. All right. So what about Mr. Dyer and the occult messages in the movies? That's why I brought Jay up, 
because he's written very serious books about occultism in the movies. Okay. I hate to tell you not to buy his two books on the subject because that's part of his income. <laughs> and one never wants to take the bread out of another man's mouth. Okay. However, as a priest and as a spiritual father, I really can't recommend that you wallow in the occult for very long, you know, to reading and reading and reading about it. You read about every single movie that he talks about and how the occult is in the movies. Try reading some of, if you're interested in this, try reading some of his articles on his website in which he demonstrates the occult nature of various mainstream movies. And it's all there. And, and I must say that things he said about movies like 2001 Space Odyssey, for example, only confirmed things that I had known and understood for years. So I wasn't surprised. You see. But then he goes into other movies because I'm not much of a movie watcher. I've, I haven't watched 1% of the movies this young man has watched. So he goes into detail on all these movies and many of them are considered mainstream movies and most people would think they had no occult message at all. But they do. And he demonstrates it. He's, not, he's no fool. He demonstrates it. He's not just grasping at straws. It's very clear. But he makes it very clear. Okay. So read some of his articles. I think you'll get the picture. No pun intended. <laughs> you'll get the picture after a few articles. He certainly has convinced me, not that I needed much convincing, that Hollywood is a giant cabal of occultists, initiating the masses into demonic experiences and demonic thought patterns. That's what's going on. It's a gigantic initiation into demonic thought patterns. And moreover, they're doing this in cooperation with certain agencies of the U.S. government. That's well documented, too, not just by Jay Dyer, but by mainstream establishment people. And Dyer talks about this in some of his talks on the Internet. And there, there are whole books about it. There are books by establishment people detailing how they're using Hollywood to brainwash the public. There's no doubt about it. So I'll leave it at that, insofar as the occult. So... Um, Jay Dyer is a very smart young man. Um, he's a, a very new convert to um, kind of a to orthodoxy. He's also taken on, he's kind of brave, he's taken on some modernist priests. There's this popular, you know, we have all these pop orthodox stars now, these celebrities, you know, who get big on the internet. One of them is this priest named Father Stephen Freeman, who denies the literal truth of the Old Testament, that, that Genesis really happened and so forth and so on. He's old. But he's supposedly Orthodox, right? OCA priest, I think, or something. He's on his, his articles appear everywhere, and uh, videos and everything. And Jay Dyer, he's just a kid, but he takes him on. And, and uh, he's he's a great Jay Dyer in his articles on philosophy and theology. He's a great apologist for uh, traditional philosophy and for Orthodox theologies. I have to say, the kid's very good, very good. But I'm just uh, sorry that he um, often degenerates into a bad style. His style is not so bad on his own videos, but then he also appears in all these so-called alt-right or so-called um, uh, dissident right um, radio shows. And the kids on those shows use a lot of really bad language, really bad language. I tried listening once, and it was just so awful. I turned off after two minutes. So, just so terrible. And so... Um, about the word. The word. Why? Yes. Well, we don't, I don't know exactly. I'm not his spiritual father. I'm not his parent. You know, and, you, never uh, know. you never know. But um, so I would say that's so. I I talked about Mr. Dyer because I was requested to, and also because he has some good uh, material on his website. But again, you have to take it all this with wisdom, with a with the grain of spiritual salt when you uh, investigate these kinds of things. So getting back to our beginning, why did we talk about all these terrible things tonight? Where we we've been talking about terrible things now for weeks is because we love the soul. We love the Christian soul. We want souls to be saved. We love our children. The priest loves his spiritual children. We want our souls to be saved. So let us be cautious. Let us turn our minds to good things. And we're in the beautiful, we're getting toward the end of the beautiful Paschal period, about to celebrate the Feast of the Ascension. And uh, the Ascension reminds us that we have to lift our minds on high. And after we examine evil things, now let's turn to good things. Apply ourselves to our prayers, our spiritual reading. Remember our true destiny, which is the heavenly Jerusalem. And, um, and put all our hope in the Lord.